We've all heard of chilling true crime stories, but what if I told you that there's one case that is genuinely the worst incident of homicide in post-war Japan? While many true crime stories can be darkly fascinating, this one crosses that boundary by miles. The case of Junko Furuta is different. This is one of the few cases that will shake you to your bones and make you boil with rage from start to end. It's not fascinating. It's just horrible. The only mystery here is about how human beings can be so unimaginably cruel, and how a judicial system can fail an innocent girl so badly after everything she went through. Before we dive right into the case, just note that the contents of this video may trigger people on the topics of rape, torture, and murder. Let's get right into it then. Junko Furuda was a 17-year-old high school student living in the Saitama Prefecture in Japan in 1988. She was smart, ambitious, and generally well-liked by everybody around her. Her grades were great, she stayed away from alcohol and drugs, and she was working at a plastic molding factory in her free time to save up for a trip that she planned on taking after graduation. She had also accepted a job that she planned to take on after she graduated. Needless to say that she had a bright future ahead. Unfortunately for her, she went to school with some juvenile delinquents that were all low-ranking Yakuza members, Hiroshi Miyano, Juuguro, Shinji Minato, and Yasushi Watanabe. Miyano had a history of committing crimes and apparently had been getting into trouble since elementary school. Reportedly, Miyano had a crush on her and had even confessed his feelings to her before. But she rejected him because she wanted to focus on her studies. Miyano's horrible reputation and his connections to the Yakuza scared most people quite a lot. But Furuta had the courage to outrightly tell him no. On November 25, 1988, Miyano and Minato were wandering around to find a victim to kidnap and rape. It just so happened that Furuta was riding back home around 8.30pm after her shift at the job. Under Miyano's orders, Minato kicked Furuta off her bike and ran away from the scene. Miyano then approached her and pretended to help her out to try and get her to trust him. Unfortunately, she did. Miyano led Furuta to an old warehouse and immediately began threatening to kill her if she did not listen to him. She tried to fight back but he managed to overpower her, after which he raped her and then led her to a hotel close by, where he raped her again. When he called up his friends to brag about exploiting her, Ugura reportedly asked him to keep her there to allow multiple people to take advantage of her. Miyano eventually took her to a park where his friends were waiting, after which they went through her bag and found her address written in her notebooks. To force her to cooperate, they threatened to kill her family if she tried to escape. They finally took her to Minato's house, which would be her prison for the next 44 days. On November 27, Furuta's parents contacted the police to report her disappearance. This made her captors force her to call her parents and tell them that she had run away and was otherwise fine. They believed her and dropped the case. The boys also forced her to act like Minato's girlfriend when his parents were around, but quickly dropped the pretense when they realized that his parents would not report him to the police. The boys brutally tortured her over the next month. The brutality of the tortures escalated over time and initially began with humiliating her sexually before inflicting physical pain. While they also gave her limited food and water initially, they eventually stopped that and gave her a diet of cockroaches and milk instead. Their later statements reveal that their tortures included, but were not limited to, making her stand outside naked during the winter, force feeding her large amounts of alcohol, making her smoke multiple cigarettes at once, urinating on her, beating her, penetrating her with various objects and burning her with lighter fluid. They even stated that at one point, they penetrated her with a hot light bulb that exploded inside her. Take a moment to let that sink in. Animals treat other animals better. 
These boys turned into complete monsters while Faruda continued to do her best to defy them and fight back. Not before long, however, the severity of the attacks and her next-to-nothing diet began to take a toll on her body. She became crippled and could not move at all. Her face became swollen. She was severely malnourished, and her body was so injured that it became unable to urinate. As a result, her flesh began to rot while she was still alive. Her condition made her captors lose all sexual interest in her and they found another 19-year-old woman to gang rape, who like Faruda, was also on her way home from work. On January 4, 1989, a final brutal attack on her would end her life. Miano had lost the game of Mahjong the night before and decided to vent his anger out on Faruda. For over two hours, her captors tortured her and beat her repeatedly. They poured lighter fluid on her and set her on fire multiple times, which she apparently tried to put out before she became unresponsive. They dropped dumbbells on her stomach, forced her to drink her own urine, placed short candles on her eyelids, and dropped hot wax all over her body. At some point, they covered their hands with plastic bags to continue beating her. She eventually went into a state of shock and began to convulse, after which she succumbed to her injuries and soon passed away. The following day, Minato's brother called to inform them that Faruda may have died, after which the panic group loaded her body in a drum and filled it with wet concrete. They went on with their lives until Miyano and Aguro were arrested on January 23 for the gang rape and kidnapping of the 19-year-old from December. Women's underwear was found at the red dresses and they were finally questioned over two months later. During their interrogation, Miyano thought that one of the officers knew about his role in Furuta's murder, thinking that Uguru might have confessed. Out of sheer chance, he told the officers where to find her body, which puzzled them since they thought that he might have been talking about another unsolved murder. The police found her body in the concrete drum the next day and identified her by her fingerprints. Several arrests were made immediately afterwards. The court initially kept the identities of the boys a secret because most of them were still minors. But a Japanese magazine called Shukan Bunshun found out who the accused were and published them. They said that because of the severity of the crimes that they committed, they did not deserve to have the right of anonymity. All of the accused pled guilty to the charges of committing bodily injury that resulted in death, instead of murder. This is where the case gets even more heartbreaking. The ringleader Miano was sentenced to just 17 years in prison. He appealed to the court but they gave him an additional 3 years instead. The rest of the boys got much lighter sentences, serving only 7 to 8 years because they were below 18 at the time. All of them were released by 2010 and went on to commit more crimes, with Minato even being charged for beating and slashing the throat of another man. Another incident shows that after Agoro was released, he was soon arrested again for beating men for 4 hours because he thought that his girlfriend was involved with him. He allegedly boasted about his role in Faruta's rape, torture and murder and even told his victim that he had killed before and knew how to get away with it. Faruda's grave was also vandalized numerous times by Gura's mother later on because she believed that her son's life was ruined by her. Yeah, this case is beyond messed up. I know that while researching for this video, I was disturbed for days. It really makes you think about how messed up we have to be as a society to let the convicts of such a ghastly crime off so easily. Because guess what? If you don't give monsters like this the punishment that they deserve, it only encourages them to commit more heinous crimes. They learn that their actions have little consequence. Yep, this case really had the worst kind of resolution ever. What makes this case so unimaginably horrible is not just the gruesome treatment Junko went through for 44 agonizing days, but also that she never got the justice she deserved, even over 30 years later. Her rapists, torturers, and killers still walk free in Japan today and have carried out more crimes since then. To give you some perspective, 
People who have gotten arrested for carrying marijuana have received longer sentences than these actual monsters. While Faruda never got the justice that she deserved, we only hope that by remembering the names and the faces of her captors, and by remembering her bravery, we could play a part in contributing to what she never received at court. She should not be forgotten, and neither should the failure of the legal system. To watch more content like this, subscribe to our channel and click on the bell to turn on notifications. If you like this video, don't forget to like, comment, and share it with your friends.